Okay, everyone, um, good evening and uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine. And uh, let me just say at the start how truly exciting it is to um, be, be holding this event in person. I still haven't quite gotten used to uh, holding these again in person. You know, we just resume, uh, zoom th resume them at this location uh, th this month. Uh, after a two-year interruption because of the pandemic. Uh, and while we're going to continue to do some events uh, online, as you can see if you check out our events uh, schedule on the website, um, we are planning to do more and more in person uh, in, in the um, weeks and months ahead as the uh, pandemic recedes, hopefully. Um, also, you know, I want to take this opportunity to to thank everyone and say you know, that PMP just simply could not have survived um, the pandemic without the continued support from loyal customers like you and and also uh, um, the uh, efforts of our of our tireless and and courageous staff. Um, you know, as a business, we're not quite fully back to where we were before the pandemic, but we're getting there. Um, and I remain. Uh, pretty confident about the future. A couple of uh, uh, quick housekeeping notes. Uh, there is a mask mandate that uh, uh, is now in effect again because the D.C. area went from green to, to yellow under this, uh, this new uh, rating system that they have. Um, so, and if you, I think you all have masks, but if you don't have one or you need an extra one, we can, uh, we can provide one. And um, it, when we get to the Q&A part of the talk, the a microphone is right here uh, where I'm looking in front of this pillar. So just step up there and ask your question. Uh, and at the end of the event, our staff would appreciate it if you'd fold up the chairs that you're sitting in and lean them against um, you know, a pillar or something, something that looks solid. Um, okay, on with our featured attraction. Uh, we're delighted to have with us Gary Gersel. It's here to talk about his new book, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, America and the World in the Free Market Era. Uh, Gary's a professor of American history at the University of Cambridge, where he's been since 2014, following a three-decade career here in the United States. Uh, throughout his career, he's written a lot about immigration, race, and nationality. And in recent years, he's focused on the history of American political thought, institutions, and conflicts. His new book is, a, is a really a, a authoritative and expansive account of neoliberalism as a, as a political order from its beginnings in the 1970s and 80s, intent on dismantling New Deal policies through its dominance in the 1990s and 2000s, and then to its demise in the, in the 2010s. Ronald Reagan, Gary writes, was the order's chief architect, Bill Clinton, its key facilitator and consolidator. And it started unraveling under George W. Bush's missteps and ultimately came undone amid the political explosions that followed the Great Recession, uh, including the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, and, and of course the rise of Donald Trump and, uh, and Bernie Sanders. So Gary's history provides um, really a compelling and an enlightening framework for viewing the past half century. And I'm sure we're in for really a very interesting discussion. And to moderate it, we're very fortunate to have one of the most uh, astute political analysts in Washington today. We try to get him to moderate uh, whenever we can. And when we can't, we have him because he's out with his latest book. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about E.J. Dion. Uh, in addition to writing an always interesting regular column for the Washington Post, EJ is a senior fellow at Brookings and teaches at Georgetown and Harvard. Uh, he's also the author or co-author of um, uh, a number of previous books um, uh, uh, about politics. Um, and the last book, which we just uh, had with him and the co-author, Miles Rappaport, last month, 
uh, is about universal voting called 100% um, democracy. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gary Gersel and E.J. Dion. Thank you so much. It's so good to be back in this store. Uh, it was very kind to, of uh, Politics and Prose to have the event on our book. By the way, you know, Brad said the business is almost back. You could walk out tonight with two books. You know, my book is over there, uh, my book with Miles Rappaport, and you should also get this uh, great book. It would be good. You'd enjoy them both, and it would be good for the business. I try uh, whenever I can uh, to accept a work that will be fun and interesting. And having to read Gary's book was really a whole lot of fun. I greatly enjoyed this book, and I think um, – and it's a challenging book for people like me who probably have a slightly more positive view of the Clinton and Obama years than Gary does, and yet the critique he offers of that period is really important. Uh, you know, I'd like Bill Clinton to review your book and come to terms with what you say, because it's not a harsh critique, it's just a clear critique. Um, and we'll get to some of it. Um, it's full of insights. One of my favorites is uh, the when Gary talks about the role of the Cold War and how the Cold War actually strengthened the New Deal order and strengthened Social Democrats by uh, creating a moment where class uh, compromise or collaboration was necessary to fight the Cold War. I want. I hope Gary uh, will talk about that. And I've been a fan of Gary's. I, I won't age us both, but since you edited the volume on, we're, we're both young. Yeah, That's right. Young. The uh, since you edited the volume on the fall of the New Deal order, which really inspired this book, and it still sits proudly on my bookshelf. So I was really happy when uh, Gary invited me to do this. So let me just start with the most, and by the way, when I'm looking at my phone, I'm not answering email or telling an editor, gee, that wasn't wrong, uh, <laughs> or something like that. Um, one of my best editors ever, uh, uh, Bill Hamilton, is in the audience here. I, I just want to acknowledge uh, Bill. He's the only uh, editor I ever had a positive dream about. <laughs> um, he, he literally, it was one of those classics, he pulled me off, I was about to fall off a cliff. And he pulled me up, and so he's great. And also, you should get a third book. Mike Kazin is in the audience, and his history of the Democratic Party is awesome, is exceptional. And uh, so let me just uh, start. Uh, so I've just got my notes for the event here. Uh, just start, why did you write this? What brought you here? And maybe tell a bit of the story from the original New Deal collection, because you're thinking about political orders is what led you into the framework that uh, is uh, sort of uh, binds this book. Are people comfortable with me talking without my mask? Is anyone oh, uncomfortable yes. with yeah, that? Yeah. Um, thank you, EJ. Um, let me first, I just want to thank Politics and Prose. Uh, it's a great ins and, and vital institution. And uh, it's so good to be here. I think this is the third book talk I've given here over the decades. Uh, and it's always special. And I also want to thank EJ for agreeing to do this. He's a busy man. And uh, he's always been a special uh, figure for me. Uh, as I moved into the more modern period of American history, uh, close to the present, some of my best educators were journalists like E.J. who were doing quite serious history. I think of E.J.'s book, uh, Why Americans Hate Politics, 1991, which for me... <laughs> uh, bless you, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, was a foundational text. I think of uh, Tony Lucas, Common Ground. I think of Rick Perlstein. I think of Jane Mayer. I think of Godfrey Hodgson, America in Our Time. Uh, these were guides to me as I was trying to understand history, and they were journalists writing the first draft of history, and um, has always been, um, uh, has given me a roadmap for trying to understand the modern period. How did I come to write this book? Well, I did write, uh, co-edit this book, The Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order, 1930 to 1980, published only 33 years ago, <laughs> and it's had quite a, an, an influence on the writing of modern political history. And it was an effort 
fundamentally to try and move the study of political history beyond the two, four, and six year election cycles that dominate so much of the history we read and think about and that certainly dominate political, political events. It's, it's obvious why presidential contests dominate our consciousness. But our intervention with the, the history of the New Deal was to argue that the New Deal was not just about the 1930s and 40s. It established a political order of electoral constituencies, interest groups, uh, intellectuals, media platforms, a moral code about what the good life in America offered, a, a, a very important narrative that could persuade people. And it's ideas once established through this complex project, which is not easy to establish, uh, but once established, a political order acquires power and endurance and the capacity to shape in fundamental ways how Americans think about their politics for a long period of time. And at the heart of the New Deal order, we could have a debate about this, but we won't tonight since I've got the floor, uh, <laughs> is, a, uh, uh, is a certain political economy that said at its most fundamental, capitalism left to itself would lead to disastrous consequences and a large centralized state was necessary to regulate the market and capitalism in some kind of public interest. And that way of doing politics and organizing the economy, the political economy, established in the 1930s and 40s, really lasts until the 1960s and 70s. And so the story we told in that book was really of a 40-year period in which core new, I new Deal ideas dominated what Americans thought was possible in the political realm. And one of the crucial tests, for me anyway, of, about the power of a political order is whether the party out of power, the party not part of the core, whether they feel some obligation or compulsion to accept their opponent's ideas. And a critical moment in the life of the New Deal order is not just FDR and Truman continuing FDR's work, but Dwight D. Eisenhower, when he becomes president, deciding not to dismantle the New Deal, but to acquiesce to its core principles. Uh, this became an idea that historians began to talk about, and I think I always in my heart wanted to um, write a sequel, <laughs> but I didn't know how or when, and then 2016 happened. And what happened in 2016? Well, a certain man like named Donald Trump, but not just Donald Trump, a certain man named Bernie Sanders suddenly became the two most dynamic players in American politics and the shapers of what was possible. And having lived through the 1990s and having been a reader of the New York Post since the 1980s on a daily basis, something I still do. I tell people it's the sports pages, but it's my window into <laughs> a certain Murdoch. Good sports pages, actually. Conserv <laughs> yeah, conservative <laughs> world. Well, they used to be better. Yeah, actually. yeah I agree. <laughs> uh, I thought about Trump. Well, Sanders was nowhere. He was just a pest in the Clinton years, the lone socialist in Congress. He didn't really matter to anybody or anything. No one really took him very seriously. He was authentic. He was, he was true. He was consistent, but he was utterly irrelevant. And Trump was a joke. Trump, Trump was a joke in New York. I lived around the New York area, and no one took him seriously. And so these two men on the margins of American politics, the complete margins, suddenly become central players able to make a difference, convulse, and in some respects transform the political world in which we were living. And to me, this, I began to think of this as a moment when something was coming apart. And there's no fun simply to write about the rise of an order, a political order. One wants to write, I felt if I was gonna do another book, it had to be about the rise and fall. And this moment seemed to me to signal some kind of fall. I wasn't quite sure how much a fall it would be or whether it was just a fracture. And so the first piece I published in this had a question mark in the middle of the title, the rise and fall question mark of the neoliberal order. But the more I got into the project and the more I got to the present day, the more I began to feel that we are transitioning into something else. Whether there will be a new political order, I don't know, or a period of chaos and incohateness and with very little sense of where we're going. Uh, but I felt we were living in a very transitional point in American politics, what Biden has called the inflection point, and I think he's right about that. And that made me want to go back and chart the rise of this formation that was 
beginning in 2016 to come apart. And that is the genesis of this book. Thank you. Um, one of the things I found, uh, there are a lot of things I found fascinating in this book, but I particularly liked your struggle with defining neoliberalism. Um, and, um, you know, it's a term that's been around for a long time, used in a lot of different ways. In the 80s, the Atari Democrats, you write about a bit, uh, will proudly call themselves neoliberal. Uh, in the recent last couple of decades, it's tended to be an epithet uh, thrown at people from the left. Um, you sort of make the excellent point that some of the forebears of what we call contemporary conservatism, like Hayek, always thought of themselves as liberals. Um, and you trace some real splits within this movement as a result. So talk to us a bit about the NL word uh, and you know, how, you, you know, how you define it and how its definition actually is important to your uh, discussion here. Thank you. I'll try not to be here for the next three hours. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not well, they've got to read the book, so you can't say it all. It's, <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, I think you, I'm not going to use the mic. You can, everyone can hear me. Oh, you need it for the, um, yeah, so I will use the mic. <laughs> if I speak too loud, I ask my sister who's sitting in the second row to hold okay. her hand up and, and or uh, my brother-in-law to push his finger down. Gary, you're not doing the right thing here. Um, we might say for, uh, first, what is neoliberalism? And then we might ask, why did I choose that term, which is still, I think, an uncomfortable one for a lot of people in American politics to use. I think it's more popular and much more accepted in Europe than it is here. And one of the measures of the influence of my book, or the lack thereof, will be uh, how much my use of the term neoliberal begins to shape political discussions, or it may or it may not. Uh, at its core, um, neoliberalism seeks to free capitalism from its shackles. It believes that um, capitalism unbound is the path toward economic growth, that markets freed from excessive and most, in many cases all, almost all forms of government regulation will lead to a world of uh, greater production, greater uh, abundance, and also greater freedom understood not just in economic terms, but in personal terms. Neoliberalism translated into English simply means new liberalism. Uh, we might ask why is it called neoliberalism instead of simply new liberalism or liberalism? Well, neoliberalism had a problem in that it wasn't the first new liberalism on the block. There was a liberalism in the 19th century often associated with laissez-faire, the idea that you move, removed monarchs, aristocrats, mercantilists, from, and other actors of the state from shackling the economy. You were free individuals to truck, barter, and exchange as they saw fit, and that would release the productive energies of the economy. This was Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. This became known as laissez-faire, just let the natural proclivities of, of human beings emerge. By the late 19th century, this has released unbelievable productive energies, but also uh, catastrophic ones, because booms were followed by busts, and fortunes were matched at the bottom by serious impoverishment and uh, misery among the working classes. And so th those who thought of themselves as liberals in the late 19th and early 20th century say we have to chart a middle way between laissez-faire, we just let people do what they want, and what was emerging on the horizon, which were the collectivisms of the left, socialism and communism. We need a middle way. And that middle way is what the New Deal becomes. In Europe, the middle way is called social democracy. But social democracy and socialism is always somewhat of a dangerous term in American political life. So the man who was fashioning a kind of social democratic formation in the United States a man that we know as Franklin Delano Roosevelt calls it not social democracy, but liberalism. And the liberalism that we have today is really a form of social democracy created in the 1930s and 40s under the New Deal and structuring American life through the 1970s and 1980s. And Roosevelt also understood this 
as a middle way between laissez-faire, let anything go of the 19th century, and the collectivisms that he saw as a form of economic and personal tyranny. This is the time when Hayek and others, and later Mil Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, uh, are also looking for a middle way between individual freedom on the one hand and collectivism on the other. They see themselves as the pioneers of a third way, but they can't call themselves liberals because the term has been stolen by Franklin Roosevelt. It's one of the great terminological heists <laughs> uh, in political history. So they have to call themselves something else, and they call themselves neoliberals rather than liberals. And, and for them, the New Deal, like they saw all of social democracy, was simply a stocking horse for communism and collectivism. You granted that, and the collectivisms would seize everything the next day, ultimately coming for your, for your corporate property, your private property, and all your investments to be transferred to the working class. And so they saw themselves as the uh, actors of the, the true actors of the middle way, but because the New Deal and liberalism were already established, they said we have to create an economy in which there are gonna be much freer markets than what the New Dealers have imagined. And if we have to use a strong state to do that, and this is how they distinguish themselves from liberals of the 19th century, if they have to use, if, if we have to use a strong state to do this, we will, but the point of using a, establishing a strong state is to create free markets and, un to, and to unshackle capitalist energies and powers. This is what neoliberalism becomes. It's the embrace of the free market. It's the release of the economy from the shackles of social democracy, of communism, and of the New Deal. Now there's another name we could call this formation, and that is the history of American conservatism. I could have written the rise and fall of the conservative order why not call it conservative? Well, what is conservatism? Conservatism is respect for tradition, respect for institutions, organic change, uh, respect for hierarchies, um, respect for traditional family life, respect for God, respect for the divine. Change should come slowly, organically. Liberation movements should be resisted. Equality for blacks ought to be resisted because that violates traditional hierarchies. Among historians, the focus on conservatism has led them to focus a lot on resistance to civil rights, a lot on resistance to liberation movements of the 60s and 70s, a lot on resistance to feminism, to freedom of choice, and all those other. And a preoccupation with conservatism has led them to focus on this aspect of American politics. And to ignore, I would suggest, the extraordinary capitalist transformation of the last 40 years associated with the IT revolution. Really a, a third industrial revolution, but let's call it a post-industrial revolution. And this is not about preserving order or hierarchy. It's about reestablishing new hierarchies, but it's about creative destruction. Uh, it's about disregard for tradition. It's about creating new industries, new, way, new media. It's about convulsing social and economic life, ultimately for the benefit of capitalists, but one that does not fit comfortably with many people who think of themselves as conservatives. So my choice of the term neoliberal is to focus on this extraordinary transformation, this extraordinary economic transformation, which I suggest cannot be understood satisfactorily in conservative terms. And so my choice of neoliberal, the term, is an effort to capture that and to center the capitalist transformation, the globalization of free markets, the carrying of free market principles to every part of the globe, convulsing all the societies that stood in the way. My use of the term neoliberal is an effort to capture that and make it what I think it deserves to be, the central story that we tell about the last 50 years. Thank you. Um, the, the you know, one of the things that hit me thinking about the two orders, and I'm going to try to link several questions together here because I want to get to the audience as well, um, that uh, eras are created out of social forces. They're created out of ideas uh, that have gestated over a long period of time. That's certainly true of both the New Deal order and the neoliberal order. But they also are brought to life by accidents or sparks. 
And I don't, you don't have to go into how the Great Depression was the moment that helped set off uh, the New Deal order. Um, but it's clear that the great inflation uh, and stagflation in the 1970s was central to the rise of the neoliberal order, that liberalism, social, uh, New Deal liberalism, social democracy appeared at the time incapable of solving some of the problems that stagflation um, uh, represented, and that's why Reagan got elected. The voters didn't go and vote for Reagan because they necessarily agreed with the whole program, but they were not happy with the status quo. Same with Hoover and Roosevelt. Um, I'd like you to talk about that, and then I want you to jump to the 90s so you could do a double account because um, I, I very much agree with your broad argument that the definition of a new uh, of a political order is the other side having to play on turf that belongs to their opponents. And you know the other classic example of that is Tony Blair and Margaret Thatcher. Um, that Bill Clinton felt uh, a certain obligation to play on this turf in order to win. But one of the things that fascinated me about your account is that there was a real break point in the, and, and maybe I want to see if I'm reading you right, there was a real break point in the Clinton administration after the 1994 election when they got shellacked. And that's when there was a real move toward uh, what we might say in conventional terms somewhat more conservative or some would say centrist or you would say neoliberal terms. So take those two, the accident of the of stagflation leading to Reagan, and then how that influenced the Clinton years. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, old orders collapse and new orders are born in moments of economic crisis. I don't know if I would call them accidents, but they are conjunctural moments. It's no moments. accident, comrade. You're quite right. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the New Deal order was born out of the, the Great Depression, then the worst depression, I guess it remains the case in American history. And the, new, the neoliberal order was born out of the stagflation and the very serious economic recession of the 1970s. The fragmentation of the neoliberal order comes out of the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. So there's a pretty consistent story that I tell of economic collapse uh, upsetting uh, governing regimes and making it impossible for the toolkit that they, they had been using up until that point to continue working. And this is what opens up opportunity for new ideas that had been on the margins. And Hayek may have won the Nobel Prize in 1974, but he was largely inconsequential until the light, late 1970s and 1980s. This opens the door for people on the margins to begin to enter the mainstream. Uh, and Keynesian ideas, the toolkit that the New Deal has, are, is not working. The uh, stagflation is baffling people. If, if, if inflation is, is, is going up, um, employment should be going down because of an overheated labor market in the 1970s. Um, unemployment is going up and inflation is going up and the two things are not supposed to happen together. So it completely confounds the dominant policymakers in the Keynesian consensus that were part of the New Deal order, and this opens up the opportunity for other ideas, monetarism, supply side economics, neoliberal economics to enter the fray. In terms of the 1990s, I'll just mention this, we may be able to pick it up later, we may not, because I'll be, br I want to be briefer in my comments. Uh, the stagflation of the 70s opens the door for Reagan. The collapse of communism, in the years 1989 to 1991 and the Soviet Union allows a neoliberal order to triumph. Uh, Francis Fukuyama said, I didn't used to like this book, but I like it more and more now. <laughs> With the passage, uh, passage of communism from the world, the last universal alternative to liberal capitalism passed from human society. I think it's a very significant moment. So it, beca it became much harder to imagine something other than a capitalist future in the 1990s. Uh, uh, Clinton is, uh, uh, he's um, a child of the new left or an adolescent of the new left of the sorts. 
Uh, he has progressives in his administration. I think there are moments in the early 90s when he, there's a genuinely uh, progressive ag agenda, certainly the health care plan of, you know, his first effort was, um, certainly fits that uh, framework. And then he gets, that fails spectacularly, and then he gets shellacked in 1994. It's important to remember that he may have been an accidental president. Without Ross Perot, George H.W. Bush might have won that election. He wins that election with 43% of the vote. Can you have this massive progressive agenda? This is in some ways Biden's problem too. When your majorities are smallish and when you're a minority president, which of course Biden is not, can you do this? There are um, progressive left members of his administration, Robert Reich, um, Joseph Stiglitz, to a certain extent, George Stephanopoulos. There are some others. But the, the defeat of 1994 is so severe, it's the worst Democratic defeat in the midterm elections, I think, since, uh, for a Democrat, since, I believe, 1946. Uh, and, um, uh, and Clinton takes that very seriously, and uh, he begins to think he cannot govern in a traditional progressive way, and he makes adjustments, and then becomes an implementer of neoliberal policies, which if you look at the list of them, is in some respects even more impressive than what Reagan did in the 1980s. NAFTA in 1994, the World Trade Organization, the Telecom Reform Act, which creates an unregulated world for the internet. One of that, that, by the way, the two, those two sections on the Telecom Act and the repeal of Glass-Steagall and financial deregulation are worth the price of the book because a lot of people forgot the Telecom Act and your, what your account of the tech uh, utopianism of the era is really fascinating. And, and you see where these tech folks, these tech prophets, where they were right and where they were wrong. And you kind of, you're, you give them their due, but you also, I think, point out where they let us astray. I think the tech utopianism of the 1990s was incredibly powerful. Uh, and what, is, what did it mean in terms of economics? Of course, there were all these new toys being invented. Uh, but one of the things that, it, it meant two things. One, this world is so new, no government, no central government can successfully manage this. And we are only going to enjoy the full fruits of this revolution if we let allow the private sector to do it. Government may have created the foundation for this, but the only way to really succeed is to let 100 flowers bloom, venture capitalists, Silicon Valley. This is one very important element of this. The other element of it is that the data that this, mar that this IT revolution was fashioning made a lot of people believe that market risk could be eliminated. And the only thing that was stopping a free market economy from really succeeding was that market risk was always present, always unanticipated, always ultimately uncontrollable. And part of what the IT, the utopianism of the IT moment signified was that we can now conquer risk because the data that we have at our disposal is so extraordinary and so precise and so minute that there will no longer be risk. So, God damn it, it's time for the government to get out of the way and let the market work its wonders, especially that we have eliminated this risk now. And even people on the left and progressives got caught up in this techno-utopianism. One of my favorite passages in that respect is, is from a book by Joe Stiglitz, which he wrote, The Roaring Nineties. And he, s he quotes John F. Kennedy um, when he goes to Berlin in 1961 and says, we are, we are all Berliners now. And Joseph Stiglitz says, in, by 1994, 1995, we were all deregulators. And he's including himself in that. And we should have provided the barrier, the limitation. We should have stopped this. Uh, but we failed to because we drank too much of the high-tech Kool-Aid. And it's in the nature of a utopian moment and it is a utopian moment. It's hard for us to imagine now because we are living through social media dystopia on a daily basis. It's hard to imagine the utopianism that enveloped this revolution and brought every people from across the political spectrum into 
the ranks. And this fueled and allowed people like Gore and Clinton to get on board fully with unleashing the market wonders of the internet. Now, we're almost out of the time before I open to the audience, so I'm going to try to smush one, two other things together here. Um, the, um, in some ways, this order should have ended flatly with the crash of 2008, 2009. That was clearly the event that sort of uh, began the decline of the neoliberal order, but it didn't really um, have that full effect. Be and the policies in the Obama years were still, to a significant degree, shaped by some of the same assumptions. And it wasn't until uh, Trump, uh, you know, until 2016 that this, uh, you know, the problems were visible. And it's, it's so interesting to think about the enormous sums the government spent in the rescue, on the rescue plan, both under Trump and uh, Biden as signifying a real break with this kind of, uh, of economics. Um, why didn't it end under Obama? Uh, so talk, uh, give us your take on that period. And then just to let you conclude, um, we, what are we in now? Uh, because your final chapter uh, suggests that we may be out of the neoliberal era, although there are still a lot of remnants. Uh, I can think of six people on the U.S. Supreme Court, for uh, <laughs> starters. Uh, you still see a lot of the techno-utopianism out in the Silicon Valley. Uh, I was just on the West Coast recently, and through my kids, I've gotten to know a lot of tech people. There's still a lot of that going on. God forbid there's all the Bitcoin and the NFTs, which is, uh, scares the daylights out of an old New Dealer like me. Um, you know, so what are we in? And um, I wrote this to Gary the other night. Um, uh, I, how many Gramsci fans are there in the audience? I, so Antonio Gramsci is a great Marxist, Italian Marxist, who's actually respected across the spectrum these days. But I, I, you know, the end of your book reminded me of this famous Gramsci quote, uh, which goes, um, where are you? Uh, the crisis... <coughs> consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Um, boy, did that feel right to both the conclusion of your book and what we're going through now. So take us from Obama to now, and then we'll open it up to everybody else. Obama to now in 20, 60, uh, 60 seconds. Right. The, um, I wish I had... I, I told EJ I wish I'd used that <laughs> phrase to end my book because it captures the moment perfectly. Uh, as to why the, the unraveling didn't happen sooner, I think the, the forces, the institutions are, are, are powerful. Obama, in a lot of ways, act, act, uh, acted immediately to strengthen the financial industry, which was the leading sector of, of, of the neoliberal world. It's also true that if protest has got to come, it doesn't tend to come immediately when the crisis economic crisis hits. There's often a lag. The Great Depression happened in 1929. Serious popular protest didn't get underway until 1934, 1935. There's a, there's a serious lag there. And I think, uh, although some of the protests began sooner, Tea Party in 2010, Occupy Wall Street 2011, uh, I think it took a while for forces on the right and left to mobilize their full arsenal uh, and it takes a while to, to make sense of what is a very traumatic moment for everybody involved when things begin falling apart. I think the Obama presidency might have been different if there had been the kind of left that there is in American politics now. Uh, there was no left of that stature or that force um, during his first term. And I think we also can't underestimate the um, the fear that Armageddon was at hand. Uh, I write in the book that uh, the 18 days in September and October 2008, this is before Obama became president, but this was the situation he was, he was facing. A group of five or 10 policymakers in the US understood that the entire financial system of the entire world would collapse entirely. And the only thing I can compare it to is the Cuban Missile Crisis, the 13 days in October 19, 62, uh, when a similar small group of policymakers knew that if they made a serious wrong step, 
they would blow up the entire world. This is what the policymakers were facing in 2008 and 2009. And Obama, who's cautious by temperament, I think um, this reinforced that tendency. And so um, uh, preserved some of the older institutions of this order. Yeah, uh, I, at the time, I remember people saying, because I was asking questions like, why aren't you tougher on the banks and all the rest? And the basic answer you got is, we are worried that this system is so fragile that a just a small shove from us could collapse the whole thing. And before we can do anything, we get, we got to prevent the collapse. And that that's very true to what I remember at that moment. Right. And if he had wanted to go in a different direction, imagining that there had been a, pop, a popular base for that, for, for going in that direction, I don't really think it existed at the time, and that mm. further constrained him. As to where we are now, I mean, the best words uh, b belong to Gramsci. Let me give you just a sense of how much things have changed. Sometimes I define neoliberalism as the four freedoms. These are not the Franklin Roosevelt four free social democratic freedoms of 1941, but it's, um, it's free trade, free movement of people, free movement of information, uh, free movement of capital. Those are the four freedoms of neoliberalism. That might be the best definition, actually. For That's the next book, The Two Four Freedoms. That somebody's <laughs> got to write that. That's I, I might steal that. <laughs> uh, we're not certain yet of Trump's legacy, but one of his legacies is to blow up the um, uh, the reputation of free trade as the only way to organize the global economy. And it's very significant that Biden has not removed a lot of the tariffs on China. That that. That moment is gone. Free movement of people, the UK de deporting people now to Rwanda is all I need to say about that. It's, hap it's being moderated somewhat by the acceptance of Ukrainian refugees, but let us realize that the same invitation for help has not been extended to refugees outside the European Christian world. Free movement of information, the internet was meant to be global and you could go anywhere on the internet anytime, day or night, contact anybody in the world and, and, and connect with them. We are now in a situation where people are building their own internet blocks. China has one, Russia wants to establish one, Erdogan wants to establish one. I'm sure Orban is not far behind. I'm sure Modi has this as an aspiration too. So we may be looking at four information blocks where people outside those blocks are blocked from getting in. And we have seen in the Ukraine crisis the most extraordinary regulation on the movement of capital internationally that, than anything we've seen in the last 70 or 80 years. And I don't think it's gonna be a temporary aberration. I, I think it's gonna open up questions of exactly how should we be regulating the movement of capital. And also the idea that states can now establish authority over information is, is raising questions, how should we be regulating these social media companies? So we can see each of these freedoms ebbing, and we can put the freedoms in quotation marks. They're freedoms only of a certain sort. And this suggests to me that the neoliberal order is unraveling, not that the ideas are gone. There's still free traders, and there's still IT enthusiasts, and uh, there, are, there are certainly in the US right now, there are people who think there ought to be uh, extraordinarily humanitarian immigration policies, uh, but these ideas do not have the authority they had when the neoliberal order was ascendant. And that suggests to me that we are moving into a different world. We can see the authoritarian face of this world quite clearly. What remains harder to see is what a progressive political order coming out of this crisis would look like. Uh, Biden and the left in his first year of the presidency had a clear vision of what that might look like. That now has temporarily failed and can't resume its march unless and until the Democrats with a progressive wing build bigger and more enduring majorities in Congress than they currently have. Thank you. Now you see why this book is so interesting. Imagine seeing it in detail and with narrative. Uh, who wants to ask uh, the first question, please? Oh, yeah, come on up to the mic. That's right. I mean, I could be like Phil Donahue and walk around, but that would violate COVID protocols. Hi, it's nice to be back here. Um, my name is Samira Daniels, and I've been in the national security community for 10 years and doing more local things. <laughs> I, I, I've been watching... Uh, 
this, not only the COVID, but the reform statistics uh, uh, circles. And uh, I, I have come to the conclusion, and, and in, in part due to Philip Tetlock's work, uh, who, who wrote Expert Political Judgment, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether you think that this unraveling of the neoliberal order, as you call it, is, is a reflection on some gaps in our education. And that ga those gaps, I think, are being picked up by, uh, uh, like, Substack and uh, other uh, social media platforms, people that have been centered. And, and I'm concerned because I, I know many of the uh, uh, COVID experts that were uh, censored and so forth, and they, they were from, you know, the great uh, universities and so forth. And uh, what, what do you think is the catalyst for what, in, you know, uh, when John Rawl, uh, Herbert Walker Bush had the, the good fortune of having John Rawls and uh, other theo you know, theologians and philosophers, you know, that, that had actual influence. Uh, do you think it's the commercialization of the of the universities uh, and just uh, th th which is d d uh, reduced the, the critical thinking uh, of the kind that's necessary to sustain the c kind of moral order that we aspire to? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I think um, social media has created both. Uh, opportunities for new discussions and opportunities to debase political speech. Uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Um, I think we might, over the next 10 years, I hope we contemplate um, uh, ways of making our, our political discussions more civil than they have been and, and more deliberative and less hot-tempered and impulsive, uh, which goes along with social media. It's not qu clear quite we, how to do that. Um, but if we can open the question of media, media, certain media being so important that they have to be publicly governed in some way, the U.S. has a strong tradition of that, as I talk about in my book. Yeah. We can begin to talk about it. I actually think there's a lot of really fascinating and interesting ideas out there, and including a lot of interesting ideas that have entered the Biden administration and the Democratic Party um, during their, their first year. And I'm really interested in... Uh, what are the moments when really interesting ideas that are forever consigned to the margins, when, they, when can they begin to move toward the mainstream and really impact policy in a significant way? Yeah, just on your question, I, was I think your book opens up some exciting possibilities for the moment as well. In other words, we, we face some of the scary aspects of it, particularly the rise of an authoritarian right, Le Pen having a shot. I was going to ask the question, is neoliberalism to blame for Trump, Le Pen, and Orban? And in a certain way, I think he, Gary would answer yes. But uh, the, um, I, I think that this moment with all those problems, actually things are loosening up as well. And so there are great possibilities here, but not all of them are good possibilities. Yes, yes negative and positive possibilities. But I, I think it's important to stress that there are all kinds of interesting ideas that have been on the margins that are seeking and have more of a toehold on, on the mainstream, and I find that exciting. What the lesson for the first year for the Democrats is they have not found a way to translate their exciting ideas that are, are out there and beginning to enter the mainstream into durable political majorities of the sort that they're going to have to have if they're going to be successful. And our next questioner has been doing that all her life, so you'll solve this problem for us, right? Uh, <laughs> the answer is unions. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was at, my late husband and I were at law school with the Clintons. Uh, and it was a tremendously exciting time, and the courts that we studied were the Warren Court. And I don't understand what happened to Bill and Hillary. Uh, I mean, they were there when I was there. <laughs> uh, they were anti-war. They were pro-civil rights. Those were, the, those were the left causes then. Um, in the 50s and the 60s, it was a much more hopeful situation. Uh, a person, a, a man working in a factory could support a wife, a house, a car, college education for his kids, health care, uh, a retirement pension, uh, and that was how we, that was, we were competing with the Soviet Union. And that's how we showed that a worker in a 
capitalist society uh, did much better than a worker in a supposedly proletarian society that was all about workers. Um, and I wonder what happened to Bill and Hillary? I mean, we all went to the same school. We all learned the same things. We all grew up in that hopeful time when corporations took care of health care, pensions, all of that stuff, um, and chose this other stuff instead. Um, I just wonder if you've thought about that. Well, you've just illustrated a really important point of the book for me, and I, I thank you for that. The, um, I think the Soviet Union had a, to rephrase something you said, I think the Soviet Union has had a civilizing effect mm -hmm. on American capitalism. By exactly. By compelling American capitalists mm -hmm. to, to demonstrate they could deliver to the average working man and woman a good life. That was better than the proletarians in, under communist rule. And better were, than now. We're enjoying uh, And part of what happened to Bill Clinton is the collapse of the Soviet Union. This is not a defense of communism. It was right. a bad tyranny that had a past in the world. But it eliminated a certain constraint on capitalist exploitation and privilege. Exactly. And part of Clinton's The civil rights movement was in part a reaction to the Cold War too. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have African, whenever uh, an African diplomat was arrested in the American South in the 1950s and early 60s, it was splashed all over the world media influenced by Pravda. And that was a lot of the world's media so part of this, the story of what Clinton and uh, so Clinton, he is a facilitator of the ne neoliberal, neoliberal triumph, but I don't think I present him as a bad guy. No. He became the president after the Soviet Union fell and the terrain of possible politics altered dr dramatically at that point and became much more constrained. And it didn't just happen here, it happened in the UK. Right. Um, Margaret Thatcher was once asked after she left office, what was your greatest achievement? And she said, Tony Blair. <laughs> and what she meant by that is that Tony right. Blair felt compelled to accept her core philosophy. The, in the 60s, the average CEO made 20 times what an average worker made. By 2000, the average CEO made 300. 300, yep. Yes. And I support you in unions, and actually they're encouraging signs, Amazon and Starbucks. Uh, and part of what would change the calculus of what's politically possible would be the rebirth of a vibrant labor movement. Right, thank Could you. I, thank yes. you. Um, oh. No, just one fact in defense of the, the Clinton period, which is that the last couple of years of the Clinton term, the second term, um, were one of the few times where each quintile rose uh, had their income rise by about the same amount. Now, mm -hmm. clearly that's more for the rich because there's more money up there, but it was an unusual period where you saw all five quintiles going up, which created a certain case for the strategy they were pursuing. Although I don't, I didn't think then, I don't think now it justified financial deregulation, which I think is one of his greatest uh, regrets. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people um, they got what they wanted for a while out of the telecom deregulation, but that I, we're going to revisit that someday, too. Uh, Michael. Um, uh, first of all, everyone, it's a great book. People should buy at least three copies of it. Uh, give it to people you love uh, and people's minds you might want to change. So, um, Gary, if you could talk a little about the cultural politics of, yeah. of neoliberalism, because one of the striking things, of course, is that the, the IT entrepreneurs, um, some of them originally, like Steve Jobs, were inspired, as you know, by the counterculture, by the whole Earth catalog, you know, by the new left in certain ways, you know, the personal computer, you know, not having these huge univacs everywhere, but having everybody have their own uh, information source right there on their desk. Um, and, and obviously, as we know, Silicon Valley, you know, votes for Democrats and pretty much always has, I think. Uh, and that's the same for other high-tech hubs, Austin and, you know, around Boston and so forth. So. How do you understand that you know disconnect, if it is a disconnect between um, the economic agenda of uh, IT entrepreneurs and their clear you know political sympathies, which are clearly at least culturally cultural issues with with um, everything progressives, not everything, but most things progressive support. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, Part of my argument about a political order is that it has to have a, a vision of a good life, that it can persuade people, that, it, that it's, it's worth living by those 
precepts, and I argue that the neoliberal order had two. Uh, one was strong, patriarchal, male-dominated families with women in traditional child-rearing and child-birthing roles with a heavy dose of the divine. Um, this is Jerry Falwell. This is George W. Bush. This is uh, Newt Gingrich. With this, this is a lot of other people. And the way in which it fits neoliberalism is that those who were neoliberals or who, or who I call neoliberals were conscious that a society given over too much to markets could lead to market excess and a declining morality and too much debt and too much gambling and too much risk taking and a deterioration in the quality of life. So if you weren't going to use the state to regulate any of this, what would regulate it? Well, strong families would provide the incubation of these proper moral values. And so this kind of traditional family life went very much along with In the high end version of that that Gary describes really well are the you know or have Gertrude Himmelfar but Irving Crystal. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Victorian view basically. Yes. Yeah. And they thought Victorian the, the British had done this well in the late nineteenth century and we could do it again now. You marry strong families with strong markets and life is perfect. Mm -hmm. Of course. The other moral code was completely different from that and that is a celebration of individual freedom. That's what markets promise the opportunity to go anywhere in the world. Associ there are no more boundaries. Capital can go anywhere. People can go, out, go anywhere. Information can go anywhere. You mix with people who you didn't mix before. Tribal distinctions break down. Uh, communication across racial boundaries, across ethnicities, across national borders, celebration of hybridities, ce celebration of homosexuality as well as heterosexuality, celebration of different forms of womanhood, feminism. Uh, all this speaks to the promise of freedom, which is one of the promises of neoliberalism, personal freedom. And this is partly an answer to your question, how did, what happened to Bill and Hillary? Well, in some respects, they stayed the same because this part of, uh, I call this cosmopolitanism, the cosmopolitan vision of the good life. Many of you here might be living a version of this cosmopolitan life that neoliberalism has made possible, even if you don't think about it in that way. And this, and this actually has got to get me in trouble. You may think I'm in trouble because I choose the word neoliberalism for something that should be called conservative, but there are all these people who believe in neoliberalism as a good term out there, and they're, I'm going to get in trouble with them by saying that the impetus for neoliberalism comes from the left as well as from the right because it comes from identity movements of people seeking to recreate themselves and wanting the freedom to reinvent themselves under circumstances of their own choosing. And this is part of the promise of the neoliberal order. And this is why I argue Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton could cooperate and collaborate as much as they did. They hated each other's guts. They represented the two alternative modalities of morality. One patriarchal, God-fearing, traditional roles for women, straight sexuality. And of course, Clinton embodied or Gingrich, just the opposite of that. And they hated each other. They fought each other. They thought if this was 200 years ago, they would think of each other as the Antichrist almost. This is how bad relations between them got. And yet on matters of political economy, they collaborated and collaborated quite closely on telecommunication reform, on deregulating NAFTA. everything on NAFTA. And this, and, and so crucial to the triumph of the neoliberal order was the ability of these morally radically divergent tribes to go coexist under harmony. Can we do one more? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just to, the short answer thus is the moderate wing of the Democratic Party is the neoliberal wing, which is high tech, so they all go there. <laughs> is that a fair summary? Mm -hmm. um, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Very much enjoyed it. Uh, I still think we need a like more concise definition of neoliberalism because every time I try to explain it to my friends, it just kind of glosses over. Um, you have one? No. Uh, you wrote the book, <laughs> for heaven's sake. Um, I mean, case in point, like, with all due respect to my colleagues here at my table, we don't have very many young people here, right? And I, I just, I don't know how to get through to them. But I think that they would be more receptive, especially than Generation X and, uh, and others, because of the way they talk, so I'm hopeful. But neither here nor there. I was wondering if you specifically could talk to, again, back to the Clinton era, what do you think the worst deregulatory efforts were? Was oh. it Glass-Steagall? Was it... Was it for certain, what about the Commodity Future Modernization Act? 
Like, is there one that you had in mind that really? There's three. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll exclude NAFTA from now. There, that would make it four. Um, the the telecom reform of '96, Glass Steagall of '98, and then commodities modernization, which made the derivative market of almost an entirely unregulated unregulated market of securities, which about which I don't need to say anything. Poof. <laughs> uh, so these these were um, the 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 great the um, the deepest expressions of commitment to 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 deregulation. It's hard for me to say um, one is worse than the other um, from my point of view. I think you know they they form a field of play and and they and they share an underlying philosophy and. Think of them as the three kings, or the three aspirants to the, the or to the, the the desire to knock the era of big government from its throne, and that was Clinton's phrase: "The era of big government is over." And uh, the most concise definition of neoliberalism: free the market from constraint. How does that differ from libertarianism? I think it's quite similar to libertarianism. It's just that part of the challenge we face, and this may be the influence of me being in Britain the last eight years, how do you, how, how do, how do you translate the terms we use in America in ways that will be comprehensible to the rest of the world? And there is no difference really between a libertarian and a neoliberal. I think they, uh, assen essentially they're the same. The, the one difference is that neoliberals will say that Libertarians will say just eliminate the state entirely and people will be free. And neoliberals will say, no, that's wrong. You need states to organize markets to put them in the best possible position to flourish. For the benefit of those few. Well, the critics of neoliberalism, that's what they say. Nancy McLean says that. Part of my message, and, and I think Neoliberalism has operated to enrich the few, but we have to deal with what David Harvey called the problem of consent, not just how did elites manipulate politics, but how did they get so many people to go along with this message? And that requires that we understand how uh, the purveyors of neoliberalism tapped into a much older history of freedom, individuality. What is the promise of America? Part of the promise is freedom individuality, reinvention, doesn't matter where you were born, what you look like, what your parents did, what religion they were, here you can reinvent yourself. Now I'm talking about this as myth, I'm not talking about it as reality, but what Benedict Anderson said about myth is true. What matters often is not whether it's true or not, but the intensity with which that myth is believed. And people believe in the message of freedom and individuality in America. And neoliberalism's success here is its ability to tap into that extraordinary reservoir of what does America represent. We can't understand Reagan without that. We can't understand on him as simply a stooge of elites. We can't understand the triumph of neoliberalism simply in terms of billionaire people clamping down on the masses and leading them astray. An important part of the neoliberal triumph is getting people across the political spectrum and across social groups to buy into the promise of freedom that neoliberalism is selling. We can still be critics of that freedom, but we ignore the success of their campaign at our peril. I just, I, I've been thinking about what you asked. The, I, I think there's another simple fact, which is the 80s and 90s economically created rising inequalities, but also created quite a significant amount of economic growth. Um, you know, and, and luckily for the politicians of neoliberalism, growth happened to be especially high in both 1984 and 1988 when Republican governments were reelected, and the economy roared in the 90s. I mean, there is just, it's an unquestionably exceptional, we haven't seen economic growth like we had in the 90s, so that the, and that, that was true in Britain, that kept Blair going, so that the, whether you believe the story or not, I think a lot of voters, they didn't necessarily buy uh, free market theory all the way, but they simply looked at those facts and those were sufficient to have them give it another chance. And that's why the economic collapse 
is what really did it in um, in 2008. That, that you could argue that it more or less delivered the goods it promised from the birth to uh, 2008. But after that, it all unraveled, so it stopped delivering. Does that make sense to you? Well, I guess I would push back by saying that I don't disagree with you if you look at macroeconomic indicators right. like GDP, but if you look at individuals and you look at the decline of yeah, pensions as I an example, right? So I guess in the weeds, again, we started to see the divergence between the top end and the lower end. Yeah, 100%. No, that, that's the b problem, and it, you saw the same problem in 1929, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, th so you can see this book will get you thinking – you should get one for you and one for the person you most like to argue with uh, because this book will arouse so many memories for a lot of people, uh, non-memories for others, understanding uh, a period that came before. And it is such a thoughtful and interesting book, and it was a privilege to be with you, Gary. Congratulations. Thanks both to Gary and EJ. Copies of Gary's book are available at the checkout desk. He'll be up here signing.